those years that everybody remembers. I, I kind of wonder whether we're going to like lose that phrase, hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, I mean, I just don't want to remember it necessarily. <laughs> Let's just, uh, I, I want something else in the rearview mirror if I'm thinking about hindsight than this year. I, I'm being facetious, right? A, a, as many difficulties as there have been, there have certainly been maybe hidden blessings in the midst of those things. And yet we, we have to realize that this year has been a lot. Now, I said it in a video on social media this past week that we, we've made it halfway through, right? I mean, let's sort of put a pin in things and celebrate the victory for a minute. We're halfway through this year, and that's a good thing. But the anxieties abound. And the uncertainties, while they may have shifted from this time a few months ago, they're still there. Psalm 94, 19 gives us a perspective that, frankly, I want to cultivate and try and fine-tune in my own life, and maybe you can relate. The psalmist says in 94, 19, in the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. I want to get there. How do I do it? How can we overcome worry and lean in on God's promises? That, that's where I want us to consider some thoughts together today. And if you want to open to Philippians chapter 4, that's where we're going to be this morning for the majority of our time together. Philippians chapter 4, where Paul very famously says, and by the way, this is an imperative. In other words, this is a command. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. All right, this is just, a much, just as much a command as thou shalt not murder. This is just as much a command as you're supposed to worship on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. You're supposed to assemble with God's people. This is a command. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Let's talk about worry in the first section of our lesson together. And what I want to do is just make four observations from the Bible about worry. And then we're going to come around in the back half and talk about how we can counter worry. And all of that from Philippians 4, really verses 4 through 9. But as we sort of survey scripture, there's one thing that I want to mention that is actually fairly obvious. And that is that worry results from inevitable stressors of life, right? Thank you, Captain Obvious, for that very insightful observation, right? Job 14, verse 1, Job says, Man, born of woman, is of a few days and full of trouble. But here's the reason why I think it's important to make that observation as obvious as it is. Because if you're struggling with something, if you feel anxious, if you feel divided in some way over, over what's happening, if, if there are things that come to your mind that make you feel a little weak in the knees or as if your stomach has turned upside down, if there are things at night that bring the tears and the fears, you need to know that you're not alone in experiencing this, that everybody deals with things. And that doesn't diminish the, the, the seriousness of what you're going through. But what it does is it adds camaraderie. We can all share in this. And so worry comes from inevitable stressors of life. And, you know, there's really nothing that we can do necessarily to avoid it. We might try and build as many walls around ourselves as possible. We might try and avoid certain stressful situations, but the stressors still come. We still find ourselves in need of comfort and peace. The second observation I want us to make today about worry is that it can be good or bad. You know, anytime I've ever preached about worry, you always get that person in the, in the foyer when you're shaking hands on the way out. I sure hope I don't worry about that sermon about worrying today. You know, you always get something like that. If you want to crack the joke, it's fine. Yeah, I don't want you to go home feeling that pent up feeling like you really need to say that out loud. So that's okay. But, uh, you know, there's a good worry and there's a bad worry. And I think this is something that when we read verses like Philippians 4, 6, we might have difficulty trying to, to figure out the balance of this, right? I mean, if we're not to be anxious about anything, then, then is it wrong for me to feel a little nervous about, you know, a loved one who's in the hospital, a diagnosis that I've been given or a friend of mine has been given? Is it wrong for me to, to feel a little anxious if I'm between jobs and I really need to find what's next? And the answer to that is, of course it's not. 
You know, even Paul himself in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, and I love the way the English Standard Version translates this. He, he talks about the cares of the churches, and the English Standard Version translates that the anxieties of the churches. He says, I feel anxious when I think about my brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know the church at Corinth really was dealing with some tough stuff. And because of that, he had to write them some tough letters. But even in, in Philippians, we see the same thing. Clearly, there's a bad kind of worry because Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. But would you be surprised to know that he used the same word in a positive way back up in chapter 2, verse 20? When he talks about Epaphroditus, who, he says, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. And the word concerned is the same term that is translated in chapter 4, verse 6 as anxious. So there's a good kind of worry and there's a bad kind of worry. There is an acceptable level of anxiety or we, should, we could say care and concern for others. And then there's the other side of that. And what that tells me is it's not so much that I am worrying as it is what I do with that worry. It's not so much that I feel anxiety as it is what I do with that anxiety. Am I going to use that as an opportunity to lean in on God and his promises? Or am I going to use that as an opportunity to lean away from God and his promises? And so Epaphroditus has concern for the people. And Paul says he shares the concern that he has for those people. But on the other side, we come down to chapter 4 and he says, don't be anxious about anything. We're talking about a test of faith here. And that leads us to our third observation of the morning. And that is that worry does not excuse poor behavior. Worry does not give me a license to be rude to someone else or, or to fly off the handle, to have a short fuse. Are you like this? Because I am. When I'm stressed about something, I have a much lower tolerance for things that just get on my nerves <laughs> than when I don't feel anxious or worried. You know, I'm pulling this from Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5, and, and this is the same context. I mean, if you go up to chapter 4, verse 2, you read about Paul, and he calls out two ladies in the congregation at Philippi, Yodia and Syntyche, and they've got a beef with one another. They, they, they've got some issues with each other, and Paul tells them they need to get along. They need to figure this out for the sake of the unity of the congregation. But then in verse 4, some scholars think maybe this is still addressed specifically toward them, you know, others think, no, this is more toward the whole congregation. I can see both sides. I think this is something that the ladies need to hear. I think this is something the whole church needs to hear. This is something I need to hear. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Always. Again, I will say rejoice. You get the impression that Paul is really trying to stress I am not stressed by that wasp that's flying around up here. I just want y'all to know. But if it lands on me, I will jump into the baptistry. <laughs> I saw you looking at it. I thought I need to tell you that I know it's there too. You get the impression that Paul wants to emphasize that he's not discounting that we have periods that are less than enjoyable. Rejoice always. And again, I will say rejoice. Remember that Paul's writing this under house arrest to the, to the church at Philippi. I mean, he's imprisoned because of the very gospel that he has preached. And he says, I'm going to say it again. Again, I will say rejoice and rejoice in the Lord. You need to remember this. And so there's a rejoicing that is to take place at all times. And you understand that that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be just over the top excited all the time. If you're rejoicing in the Lord always, sometimes that means I'm rejoicing in the peace that he provides. Sometimes it means I'm rejoicing in the comfort that he gives. Sometimes I'm rejoicing in the fact that there's mercy for me, even when I've fallen away and done things that I shouldn't have done. I rejoice in that. Sometimes the rejoicing comes through tears. Sometimes it comes through song. Sometimes it comes through prayer. Rejoice in the Lord always. But then in verse 5, he talks about reasonableness. Let your, the New King James says gentleness. The King James Version said moderation. The term ESV, reasonableness, means a readiness to listen. To listen to reason. A willingness to yield 
personal rights for another's benefit. Now, I know that those ladies, Yodia and Syntyche, needed to hear that. They were fighting with one another, and nobody was willing to compromise. And Paul said, let your willingness to yield for the other person's sake be known to all people, to everyone, because the Lord is at hand. You don't want the Lord to return, and you be in this skirmish with one another. How embarrassing would that be to have to face the Lord and say, well, you know, she didn't talk to me this one time. Or whatever the situation was. It was something silly. You know, we all go through stuff like that. But as I think about what he goes on to say about anxiety, do not be anxious about anything. I also think about the way that sometimes I act and react when I am in a stressful situation. And how, as I mentioned a moment ago, my patience isn't what it ought to, always ought to be. And Paul says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. You make sure that you still treat people the way that they ought to be treated, the golden rule of Matthew 7, 12. You ensure that you don't use your stressors as an excuse to take it out on somebody else or, heaven forbid, on God himself. And we do that, don't we? Well, this has been such a hard week. I'm not going Sunday morning. I'm just not doing it. I, I, I'm so frustrated that I'm just going to say whatever I want to say. I'm going to get online and finally speak my mind. Let your reasonableness be known to all. Think about other people, how it benefits them. Your worry does not excuse poor, or we could really say sinful, behavior. In the fourth place, I think we need to recognize that worry is an issue of faith. And for this, I want to appeal to the words of Jesus, going back to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. You know, the term worry, I'm told, translates a compound Greek word that means a mind that is divided, a divided mind. It's interesting in Matthew 6, verse 24, that Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now, in context, and we see what Jesus is saying specifically at the end of this verse, you cannot serve God and, ESV says, money. Older translation says, said mammon. And the idea is just physical things, you know. He previously said, don't lay up your treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break in and steal. But instead, lay up for your tre yourself treasures in heaven where none of that stuff happens. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. All right, so he says, you don't need to have a divided mind. And it's no surprise to me that after he says, you can't serve two masters, you have to be fully devoted to one. And Jesus is saying, obviously, to him. He comes down in verse 25 and says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. Don't be anxious about your life. And what's interesting is when Jesus begins to give illustrations about this, he talks about the necessities. What you will eat what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on clothing. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Worry is an issue of faith. And that's why we said in the second observation this morning that there's a good worry and there's a bad worry. And the difference is what my faith does with that. How I respond. Do I respond in faith or do I respond in fear? Do I respond by leaning in on God or do I respond by turning away from him? That's the difference as best as I can see it. You know, worry is completely unproductive. It does nothing to really help anything. It's one thing to think through a situation and be prepared for things when life comes at you, right? Right? It's another thing to be like, I guess we could illustrate it by like wringing our hands, stuff like that. Uh, you know, the, the science of this kind of breaks down like this, that 40% of the things that people worry about never happen. 
that 30% of the worries are related to matters of the past. I can't do anything to change that. You know, I'm just, I'm worried about what happened or maybe what the consequences of that might be. Uh, the science says that 12% of worries have to do with health, but you aren't sick. By the way, something tells me that stat's probably up in 2020. What do you think? 10% of worry is about friends, family members, relationships. I don't know if that's true in your life. You know, it may be different in terms of how you might categorize it or give some kind of colloquial percentage of that. But what's interesting is, you know, none of these things really, I can't do anything about this stuff. 40% of the things that people worry about never actually come to be. That means 60% actually does, right? But 40%, that's a pretty big figure. Do not be anxious about anything. The scientific research says that about 8% of worries seem to have some basis in reality. That maybe they're justified in some way, shape, form, or fashion. I don't think that it would be fair for us to take Matthew chapter 6 and to walk away from that by saying something like, well, see, Jesus said you're not supposed to think about where you're going to get your clothes or how you're going to put food on the table or, or how you're going to get anything to drink. As we said, those are the necessities, right? And we have to balance that over against a passage like 1 Timothy chapter 5 that says that if a man will not provide for his own, then he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. At the same time, though, the psalmist says in Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. God takes care of us. And how exactly he's going to do that, we may not know. But isn't it the unknowns that really cause the worry to begin with? That really cause the lack of peace? It's stressful just talking about this first point, right? So let's counter worry. Let, let's hasten to get to the solution. And the wonderful, beautiful thing is the gospel provides us the solution. So let me invite your attention back to Philippians chapter 4. And let's see what Paul has to say about it. I mean, aren't you thankful that Paul didn't just say, don't be anxious about anything? What he did is he followed that up by giving us the prescription, the path. Here's what you need to do in order to counter worry. And I want to focus on three things in the back half of this lesson. Number one, we can counter worry with a sense of our worth. Now, let me remind us of what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 6, consider the lilies of the field. It's a pretty good time to think about the lilies of the field, isn't it? Summertime, springtime that we've just come from, and how beautiful everything has been. You know, in Charleston, there's like a few days of bloom and then everything scorched to death. You know, and so we're really enjoying this, although my allergies are reacting to this lengthened period of pollination. But anyway. Jesus says, those flowers don't have to worry about how beautiful they're going to be. Even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. You remember the Queen of Sheba comes to Solomon in the Old Testament. She's got to see this for herself. The, the rumors about this guy, this king in Israel cannot possibly be true. And she comes and she says, you know what? The rumors didn't even live up to everything. It, they were only half of what I have now come to see. And Jesus says, Solomon in all his glory was not as beautiful as the lilies of the field that God provides for every single day. The birds of the air, they're not worried. They're not stressed out about where their next worm's going to come from, you know, where they're going to eat next. God provides for them. And then Jesus says, are you not of more value than they value? Are you not more valuable to God than a bird of the air. In another context, Jesus says that God knows when every sparrow falls. Have you ever hit a bird with your car? You know, just kind of flying from one to the other right at the time that you were coming and you just made instant contact. You look in the rearview mirror, feathers everywhere. Have <laughs> you seen that? God knew when that happened. God was aware of, of that bird falling. How many birds die a day? I have no idea. I don't even know if, I, if Google even knows that, you know. But God knows. 
And if God cares enough to know when a bird dies, and then Jesus sets over against that this thought, this truth, you are more valuable than that. He continues in Matthew chapter 6. I asked you to go to Philippians 4. I think I did that a little too early. He says, do not be anxious, verse 31, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is not a prosperity gospel. This is not put money in the plate and God will bless your life. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying is if you seek God, if you make your life about God, God will take care of you. Because that's what he does. He takes care of his own. Now there's an extent to which he takes care of everybody. The sun shines and the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. But God takes care of those who are righteous. So in verse 34, Jesus not only talks about present anxieties, but tomorrow's anxieties. Do you do this? Borrow from tomorrow's troubles today? Oh, I'm stressed because I got this coming up or that coming up. Jesus says in verse 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. There are going to be things that will be stressful tomorrow, just like there are things that are stressful today. So we'll just take one day at a time and one step at a time with Jesus. You know, Romans 8 is not a context about worry or anxiety, but, but it, there's a truth there that, that really speaks of this situation and to talk about your worth to God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, Paul says, He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, will he not also with him, with Jesus, freely give us all things? God has given you the most precious gift possible. And because of that, what's he going to withhold from you? God cares for you. And that helps me to counter worry. God cares about me. If God cares about a bird that fell, and Jesus says, you're much more valuable than that. If God clothed in such ornate beauty the, the grass of the field, the flowers of the field, which today are, and then, you know, it won't be many days from now that those blooms will be gone. And then the Lord willing, the season will change and things will turn brown and all that stuff. And if God cares so much to, to endow those plants of the fields with such beauty, what do you think he's going to do for you and me? In the second place, here's how we counter worry. I counter worry with prayer. And that's where we get back to Philippians chapter 4. There's a, there's a contrast that's made. There's a, there's a nothing and there's an everything. In verse 6, Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. All right, we've got several words here that are, that are given to describe prayer. We have the word prayer, which means a Godward attitude. I'm thinking about and toward God. I'm telling God what it is that's on my heart. And that's the word supplication. Supplication is an expression of need. With thanksgiving... All right, thanksgiving, good. I'm focusing on what is good and right, what is pleasant. Let your requests, the word requests translates a term that means prayer for a definite, specific object, need, or thing. All right, so Paul says, don't worry, do not be anxious. Instead, here's what you ought to do. Turn your heart to thinking about God. Make your request to God. And be specific before his throne. Tell him, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I need help with. This is what I need your peace. Why I need your peace. And when you do, look at the result, verse 7. The peace of God. There are three characteristics about the peace that Paul promises to Christians when they pray. When you're anxious, pray. Don't just pray, pray specifically. Tell God exactly what you're struggling with. And when you do, verse 7, you, the result is peace. Not just any peace. Number one, peace of God. It's divine. This is a divine peace. Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, but my peace. In this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. 
divine. In the second place, it's a peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Now, in the past, I understood this phrase to mean that God's peace is beyond our comprehension. And that was, that was pretty comforting to me. I still believe that's at least in part what this passage teaches. God's peace is beyond what we can possibly comprehend. And so I, I, know, I know how I feel when I'm anxious. I know what it feels like to be worried. But over against that is a peace that is beyond my wildest dreams. I think that's neat. But I think there's more to this text than that. You see, Paul uses the word surpasses. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It's a term that means better than, exceeds. Paul used it two other times in Philippians, but I'll just give you one. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8 where he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says there is nothing in this life that can compare to knowing Jesus. All right, take that meaning and put it into our text. It's the same Greek word. And what I find is that Paul is saying not only is the peace of God beyond my comprehension, but the peace of God exceeds knowledge. I worry because of what I don't know. I grapple with things because I want more answers. I want to know. Is a face mask really helping or is it hurting? I'm reading both sides. Can the virus really spread that easily or not? I read both sides. Should I stay inside all the time or should I be willing to get out some? I read both sides and all I want is answers. And I want them to be bipartisan. I want them to be facts. I just don't know. I don't know. How long is this going to last? I don't know. When will we we'll be able to come back to having 930 Bible class and 1030 worship the way the Lord intended it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Knowledge. But God gives us instead something that's better than the answers. Something that's better than knowledge. Better than if I knew everything that I feel like I need to know. That's what Paul is saying in this text. The peace of God that is excellent, more excellent than. It exceeds. It's better than having all the answers. It's the peace of God. And it's better than what you can comprehend or understand. It's better than knowledge. And it will, here's the third observation, guard your heart. It will not take away the stress. It will not remove the problem. That wasn't promised in this text. What was promised is that God's peace, which is better than anything that you're worried about, will set a hedge around your heart. Guard. This is a military term. Guard your heart, your emotion, and your mind, your intellectual side in Christ Jesus. That's the sphere where that happens. In Christ, Christians. So Christians have this promise that when they're anxious, what they ought to do is to reach out to God, turn their hearts to God, make a specific request of God in full assurance that the result will be he will give you a peace that is divine, a peace that is better than what you're worried about, and a peace that will set a hedge around and like an army guard your emotions and your intellect and help you to achieve a peace. God cares for you, but God also shares his peace with you. It's the peace of God. But here's the third point, and quickly. I counter worry with repentance. I'm not going the direction that maybe you think I am. I'm I'm not talking about, you know, well, you ought to quit sinning so that that you won't be worried about stuff. Uh, Even the saints worry. Even those who are striving to walk on the straight and narrow way worry about things. But you know, the word repentance in the scripture means to change the way you think. And I think that's what Paul gets at in verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true... 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice and these things, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. All right. So we have a prescription in verses 8 and 9 and then a promise at the end of verse 9. Uh, verse 8 says you need to change the way you think about things. And I find that that's important for me. When I'm really stressed about something, if I can get away by myself for maybe 15 minutes and, and offer a specific prayer the way that verses 6 and 7 prescribed, and then with, with the peace that I immediately feel after that, I start sorting through things. And I began to realize that maybe things aren't quite as doom and gloom as I originally feared that they were. I try and think about things that are true, dependable. When I worry, I'm focused on the shaky ground. Think about something that you can depend on. What's true? And then things that are honorable, things that are worthy of respect, things that are noble. And then think about things that are just. You know, the, the idea of justice is actually defined differently by God than it might be by a human court or a human judge. But God's justice means that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to others what God would give to them within the bounds of realizing that ultimately vengeance belongs to God. But God responds to me with mercy and love and kindness, and that's the way I want to respond with other people. Whatever's pure, whatever's holy... Whatever, you know, sometimes when I'm worried about things, I begin to have unholy thoughts. I begin to think things. Maybe I want to say things that would be profane, speaking profanity. I don't want to do that. Whatever is lovely, those are things that are attractive. Think about those good things. Whatever is commendable, something that is well spoken of. If there's any, and then he gives these umbrella, if there's anything that is excellent, virtuous, strive worthy, Things that will motivate you to do the right thing. If there's anything that is praiseworthy, think about this stuff. And when you do, verse 9 says, you will practice these things. Now, repentance, change the way you think. When I change the way I think, it results in the change in the way that I live. And so in verse 9, he says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says, I want you to practice these things. And when you do, ah, this is great. The God of peace will be with you. Let's back up and see what we've learned. You can counter worry, first of all, with emphasizing your worth, what you mean to God. And, and we notice that that means God cares about you. You can counter worry with prayer. God shares his peace with you. God cares. God shares. But then when I come down to repentance, what I see is that God is there with you. Notice in verse 6, we have, rather verse 7, the peace of God will guard your hearts. But in verse 9, we have the God of peace will be with you. When I reach out to God in my anxieties, the promise of God is that he literally comes to my side. And he guides me through his word in thinking right and living right. Giving me a peace that is better than the knowledge that I desperately seek in response to the things that I've been struggling with. And that's, at least according to Paul in Philippians and Jesus in Matthew, what we do when we're anxious. So it's our faith that can literally prevent our worries. Our faith in God, our faith in his promises, our faith in his salvation, our, our faith in the confidence that what we're doing is right and that God has told us to do this. It's our faith. And it's faith that splits the difference between acceptable worry and sinful worry. It's faith that helps me, as we sang before the sermon, to anchor myself in Jesus. To know that even when the storms blow hard, I'm going to remain firm. This morning... Don't leave here today without that kind of faith, without a confidence that your soul's salvation is secure, and without knowing that when you need to cry out to God, God will respond in that kind of peace.
If there's somebody here this morning who hasn't named the name of Jesus, can we please urge you to consider baptism? Baptism into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, to be identified as one of His own, so that you can enjoy the blessings that are in that realm, in Christ Jesus, as we spoke of a moment ago. And if you're ready to be baptized today, don't delay. We'll stop everything and rejoice with you right now as you put on your Lord in baptism. If you have another need, maybe as a Christian you're struggling with something that we can help you with, this is another blessing of how we can counter worry. We can share that with one another. And please let us know how we can help and serve you. We have an opportunity now to do that. If you need to respond to it, please come forward while we stand and sing together.